morning, New Hope, community, church, family, and friends. And those of you that are watching online this morning, God bless you and your families. Um, I know we had Thanksgiving a few days ago, and I hope and pray that your Thanksgiving was blessed and that you had joy and peace and comfort in gathering around family and friends that you had over at your house. So praise God for that. Um, this morning, we are going to be looking at three different scriptures this morning. And um, first scripture is going to be... Uh, Mark chapter 7, 20 through 23, and um, this sermon is titled on how to repent of all sins in our Christian life. Um, you know, repentance is a beautiful thing. Um, repentance is breaking free from the ties and bondages of this world and the sins that so easily corrupt us and is a process of being transformed into the likeness of Christ. Amen for that. So as we see here in our first scripture, Mark 7, 20 through 23, we see, and he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For whom within, out of the heart of man, come evil, thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and defile a person. And I know that seems like a lot, like, oh, wow, that is a lot of things. And it is. But we see here that um, Mark is explaining that an evil action begins with just a single thought, allowing our minds to dwell on lust, envy, hatred, or even revenge. All will lead to sinful actions. Uh, we must not make ourselves unfit for God's work by dwelling on our sinful actions. We must not make ourselves, or I'm sorry, we must not make ourselves unfit for God's work by dwelling on sinful activities. Nothing good can come from thinking about something bad. Instead, we need to follow the Apostle Paul's advice he gives us in Philippians 4.8 and think about what is true noble, right, pure, lovely, and admirable. But then the more I study the scriptures, um, the more concerned I am about sin in the life of a Christian. Um, we don't take sin near seriously enough in Western Christianity. And that is a big reason why the church looks a lot like the world that we live in today. We don't recognize the need for true repentance. We're so filled up on God's grace that we feel the need not to repent at all. And what we need is true repentance. So what is true repentance? Well, it's not just asking God for forgiveness and confessing to God of our sins. It's turning away from sin and turning to God and His will for our lives and truly meaning it from our heart. So now as we look at 1 John 1, 8 through 10, it says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. You know, our God is a gracious God, so good. And He forgives the sins of those who put their faith and allegiance in Jesus Christ. The false teachers denied in 1 John that sin breaks fellowship with God because they denied even having a sinful nature. So they also denied that their conduct involved any sin at all. That lie ignores one basic truth. All people are sinners by nature and by practice. All our sins are forgiven, past, present, and future ones. Yet, even after we become Christians, we still sin and need to confess it. This kind of confession is not offered to gain God's acceptance, but to remove the barrier to fellowship that our sin puts between us and Him. You know, I'm the leader here at New Hope Community Church at Celebrate Recovery, and Celebrate Recovery is a very, very hard ministry. Um, just for the simple fact is, just what this is saying here, um, it's hard for us to uh, 
confess our things and our faults to God. But that is one thing that in order to heal, in order to begin that process of healing, we must confess our sins to God and also to somebody that we trust, another brother or sister in Christ. Um, you know, many people find it difficult to admit their faults and shortcomings. And I see that a lot in Celebrate Recovery. And that's one thing that holds a lot of people back from God's healing and nurturing is that they are so ashamed of the guilt and all their shortcomings that they don't even want to confess it to God. You know, but to recognize our sinful weakness takes humility and honesty. And most would rather just pretend that they are fine and that nothing's wrong. Um, you know, but we need to not fear revealing our sins to God. He already knows them already. He will not push us away, no matter what we have done. Instead, He will draw us to Himself. Praise God for that. So here we see John attacks the second claim of these false teachers, that people have natural tendency towards sin, that they are without sin, and that they are thus incapable of sinning. The false teachers refused to take sin seriously. They wanted to be considered Christians, but they saw no need to confess or repent of their sins. The death of Christ did not mean much to them because they didn't think they needed it. So instead of repenting and, by, and being purified by the blood of Jesus Christ, they were lying and encouraging believers to sin. In this life, we are always capable of sinning, so we should never let our guards down. When we do sin, we have the promise that Jesus will forgive us. Repentance frees us to enjoy fellowship with Christ. It should ease our consciences and take away our shame and lighten our burden of guilt. But some Christians do not understand how confession works. They feel so guilty that they confess the same sin over and over then wonder if they might have forgotten something. Others believe that God forgives them when they confess, but if they died with the unconfessed sin, they would be forever lost. But we must understand that God wants to forgive us. He allowed His one and only beloved Son to die for us, just so He could offer us pardon for all of our sins. He canceled all our debt and dismissed all charges. When we come to Christ, He forgives us all sins we have committed or will ever commit. So we should continue to confess our sins, but not because failure to do so will make us lose our salvation. Our relationship with Christ is secure. Instead, we should confess so that we can enjoy maximum fellowship, joy with Him. True confession also involves a commitment not to continue in sin. We wouldn't be genuinely confessing our sins to God if we planned to commit these sins over and over again and just wanted uh, temporary forgiveness. Rather, we should pray for God's strength to defeat temptation the next time we face it. You know, I want us to see here that if we have active sin in our lives, those sins are not forgiven unless we repent of them and turn away from them and turn to God. That is why it is important for us to conclude each day in prayer and make an inventory of our day and confess and repent of any sins in our lives. You know, I make sure that um, before I go to bed at night, because I know I'm human, sometimes I, I sin during the day, and even there's sins that I don't even know I did, I take an inventory before I close my eyes and go to bed and ask God, God, I repent right now in the name of Jesus that if there's anything that I did today that is not of you, I'm asking for forgiveness and I want to repent of that and turn away from it and not help me not to do it again tomorrow. And if there's anything that I didn't know I did, God, cleanse me from that right now. And that is a ritual that I've been doing for a little while now. And, you know, none of us are promised tomorrow. I don't want to not wake up one morning and have any unforgotten sins or any sins that I have not repented for. I want to make sure that I have a place in the kingdom of heaven with God and Jesus. Amen. Um, you know, it's important to understand that uh, 
there is a distinction between active sin and being tempted. To be tempted is not a sin. Jesus was tempted, but he did not give in to the temptation. So to be tempted is not a sin, but if we are tempted and we give in and indulge in that sin, in the thought, action of it, then we have sinned. But don't worry, God provides a way of escape for every sin that dares beset us. So now we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And we see here, uh, no temptation has overtaken you that this is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So God's promise is right there is he's not going to, no temptation is going to be beyond your ability to not have temptations to go and do something. Right here we see that God gives us a way to escape that. Well, you might ask, well, how do we escape our temptations that come in life? How do we get away from that? Well, we're going to look in Galatians 5.16. It says, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. You see, it is impossible to walk in the Holy Spirit and walk in sin at the same time. It cannot be done. I believe that. If you're walking in the Spirit and, and you, you are seeking God's presence every day of your life, and when temptation comes and that thought or action wants to take over, you go right to God right then. You don't give it no thought. You don't give it no time to dwell in your head and get inside you and start dwelling up any type of resentments or any, any lustful thoughts. You know, we must walk in the Spirit. Because if we do, we see right here God's Word says, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not, will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Amen for that. So here we're given an instructions on how to overcome sin in our lives. But to overcome, we must apply His truth by walking in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit was given to us by Jesus as a deposit within our souls to help lead us into all truth and purity. You know, we were buried with Him in His death on the cross. We are therefore dead to the sin that He died to destroy. And now we are alive in Jesus. We are reborn as alive in Christ and dead to sin. So I would encourage us to continue fighting and walking out our spiritual life. But to live free of sin, I must emphasize this. It is not a checklist of to do's and not do. To live free of sin is to live so completely yielded to the Holy Spirit, so completely surrendered to Jesus Christ, so completely adherent to the will of our Heavenly Father, that sin is rendered powerless. Hear that again. This, if we live so completely and adherent to all these things, sin is rendered powerless. And I declare that in my life and in your life as well. Temptations will come, but our yielding to the Father will win the day over those temptations. Win the day over the temptations. Praise God for that. You know, but if we're playing a game with God, like a lot of us do, and I'm guilty of it as well, um, where we sin, then repent, then the next day we're sinning again, um, that is not good. In that situation, we need to ask God to help us fear Him. Ask Him that again and again to put the fear of the Lord in us. Then we will tremble before His throne. We will tremble about the fires of hell and will be zealous and repent quickly of that sin. And that is true repentance, which is only enabled by the Holy Spirit. It starts with grief, then fear, then a sincere turning and practicing a daily new lifestyle. Hear that again. It starts with grief. We must mourn over our sins for they shall be comforted. and practicing a daily new lifestyle. Once again, I speak from experience on this. I played that game with God. You know, I would uh, think that sometimes I would put sins in categories 
and think a little sin if I told a lie or if I maybe curse somebody out on the road today, that it's okay. That's not a big sin. I don't need to repent for that. And I played that game with God until I started studying Scripture and know that uh, <laughs> that, is not, that is not right. Because in God's eyes, sin is sin, no matter what it is. All sins are equal in God's eyes, and they should be in ours as well. So, you know, I play that game with God. I, so I asked God for that fear, and He gave that fear of the Lord to me. Now I have repented, and it's a real repentance, which is only a true gift from God. I had the fear of the Lord in me that if I don't repent of something, that I know there's a special place, and it's not heaven, that I will be, and that is in hell if I don't repent of my sins daily and ask God for forgiveness of those. You know, I know, you know this isn't a uh, typical feel-good sermon or a favorite topic to preach on. Um, you know, I would prefer to focus on God's grace, on the love of Christ, and the forgiveness and mercy of Him, and the eternal life given to us. That's what I love and like to think about. All those things are indeed true about God. But... I would not be a faithful minister of the gospel if I did not warn myself and you listening today about the dangers of living in active sin as a Christian. You see, God preserves us in the palm of His hand, and He comes to us and rebukes and disciplines us when we get off track. But we know when we're straying from God's path, we know when sins are active in our lives. And there does come a point when we step outside of His will and plan for us. We have those choices to make. So let's not be deceived by elaborate theologies. Let's put the Scriptures before theological allegiance. And the Scriptures talk again and again about falling away and encouragements to abide in Christ. You know, as it says in... Uh, 1 Timothy 4.1 Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Hear that again. Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. You know, don't take my word for this. I would encourage you to examine the Scriptures yourself. But I would also give you this encouragement. Put the Scriptures above a theological allegiance. Don't try to force the Scriptures into the theology that you prefer. Instead, let the Scriptures speak for themselves. God's Word is active and alive. Just as Jesus Christ taught the seven churches in the book of Revelations, we must be focused on determined, must be focused, determined, and hardworking in the spirit to repent of sin and ensure that we are in the will of God. God will make his will for our lives clear and we must follow it. The scriptures say that many will come to Jesus and say, Lord, Lord, remember all we did for you in our lives and the miracles we performed. And Jesus will say to them, Depart from me, I never knew you. Matthew 25, 31-46 We need to be obeying God's will if we expect to share eternal life in heaven. You know, I also want to add a little bit to this. and You know, this is big for this of repentance and asking for forgiveness. Is uh, We must not harbor any unforgiveness or hatred for those who have harmed us in the past or present. Take some time in prayer on your knees to search through your heart for any unforgiveness and anger and hatred. Ask the Holy Spirit to teach you and reveal these things to you. Then declare forgiveness in your heart and love in your heart. Remember that the Lord said hatred is murder. Hear that again. Hatred is murder. Wow, that's, that's hard to take in. You know, because you put some of us, we put murder on such a high sin scale. When, like I said before, sin is sin. So if you hate somebody in God's eyes, you have murdered them. 
So I encourage us to let's get rid of any anger and hatred. Ask the Holy Spirit to continue to search and reveal these things to you and declare forgiveness in your heart and love in your heart. So as we see in 1 John 4.20, also recall that Jesus said that if we don't forgive others their debts, then our debts won't be forgiven. Jesus forgave us all our sins, and our response is to forgive those who have done unspeakable evil to us. And I know that is hard. It is real hard. But offering forgiveness isn't so much for the other person. Offering forgiveness is for your own self. <clears throat> or even the small things we've been forgiven. So we must forgive. We see that in Matthew 6, uh, verse 15. You know, I want to start to finish here. And, you know, we must not be lukewarm. We must be on fire for Christ. We must truly follow and obey Him. You know, the church that Jesus addressed in the book of Revelations, the church in Laodicea, have become lukewarm. They were so wealthy and affluent that they couldn't recognize that they were poor, blind, and naked. They needed to be clothed themselves in Jesus instead of relying on their wealth and power. You know, I believe that we have that same problem here in the United States today. We need to truly submit to Jesus and completely rely on Him of worldly wealth because greater is He who lives in me than he who is of this world. So I know some of us, you know, we, we so focused on our power, our wealth, how much money we're making, all the nice cars we got. None of that matters. None of that matters because if we're not clothed in righteousness and we're not clothed in Jesus Christ, that is all for nothing, you know. So I want to say this, you know, this message was uh, very difficult for me to write and prepare for. Um, I don't like having to share this type of message, you know, but in fact, I tried to avoid this in reality. I was, I was preparing um, to prepare for a different sermon. The Holy Spirit would not allow me to focus and, and prepare for anything, you know. So as I prepared for the last couple of weeks, you know, sharing a different message, you know, the Holy Spirit was not allowing me to. So I was listening to God and I was obeying God, you know. I wanted to hear exactly and make sure I was hearing from God and not what Joe wanted. And this was the message God was speaking to me to do. You know, I resisted it and I fought against it for a few days desperately wanted to believe that sin wasn't such a big deal. <laughs> I wanted to believe eternal security. I wanted to believe that active sin wasn't such a deadly foe to eternal life. I wanted to believe that the extra grace that God gives us would cover over those sins I was practicing each day. But I realize now that for those in active sin, their lot is in the lake of fire. It doesn't matter how well we've served Jesus or how many souls we've won for the kingdom or how faithfully we've taught Scripture. God shows no favoritism. So we must be careful not to disqualify ourselves while running this race of serving Jesus. You know, hell is a real place. If we go there after we die, we will be conscious. We will be able to feel and we'll have our senses and be able to think and reason and be able to recall all the chances that we had to repent, but never did. I don't say that to scare us, but, I, but because I don't want any of us to go there. And our God is a righteous judge. He will return in power and in glory to rule His people. He will bring into judgment all things we have done. But don't be afraid, brothers. I've got great news. God will help us overcome all sin in our lives. And to he who overcomes, they will be given a crown by Jesus. And once we're in heaven with Jesus, there, will, there is no longer suffering, no longer danger of sin. We will be free to the holy, to be holy, pure and clean. And it will be so wonderful. Heaven is real. So choose heaven instead of hell.
you know, this is a hard message to share today, but I believe with all my heart and soul that this message is true and of Christ. We must take sin seriously, and we can and we will. Amen. And when we do, and when we cooperate with the Spirit in putting to death the sins of the flesh, we will make it to eternal life with Christ in heaven. We will be pure and spotless in His sight if we are zealous and determined to walk in the Spirit and not the flesh. Remember this verse, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Praise God for your word. Heavenly Father, let's, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word that is active and alive, God. We thank you for the opportunity to repent and the opportunities you give us for forgiveness and all the sins we have ever done and will do, God. But I pray as we, we repent and we ask for forgiveness and confess these sins to you, God, I pray that we would do it from our heart, that it would be true repentance, that we would grieve over these and mourn over our sins, God, and fast and pray over them, God. Lord, so I pray right now that if there's anybody here that has not offered repentance to you, that has not asked for forgiveness, that has not confessed anything to you that they need to, God, I pray that this message would penetrate their heart, God, and I pray that they would go to you in repentance, go to you and walk in the Spirit and not the flesh, God. You know, I, I know coming to Christ that we, we don't become sinless, but we do sin less. God, so I pray right now in the name of Jesus for anybody listening this morning, God, that you would just have your mighty healing hand upon them, God, that you would just tear out anything in their heart that is not of you, God, and replace it with that joy, peace, and comfort that you give us and that forgiveness, love, and mercy that we all know who you are, God. We thank you. We bless you. We thank you for your faithfulness, for your goodness. Lord, And we just bless your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.